Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today. My name is Josh Winton and I'm going to be presenting on standards for proper mold remediation. So let's get started. So a little introduction, a little uh, background information on myself. So I'm a licensed mold remediation and mold assessment contractor down here in sunny South Florida. I have two companies to speak of, that is Discrete Restoration, offering restoration services, and Discrete Air Quality, offering everything that is indoor environmental. I have 15 years of mold remediation, water damage experience specifically, um, I have a lighter two years of experience within the mold assessment arena. During the time in the mold assessment arena, I did acquire my CIE, which is a council certified indoor environmentalist certification. That is from the ACAC. I do have a bachelor's degree, the BA in computer engineering. I am an active member of numerous industry specific groups that's everything from the online facebook groups that are out there uh, as well as even a couple of local groups one in which we meet monthly just to talk about everything that's restoration um one of my claim to fames if you will is i am an avid youtuber i don't post quite as much as i'd like to but we're working on that um, i do have a youtube channel titled IAQ Josh. I know, big surprise there. Uh, this discusses everything from industry-specific content as well as my journey throughout the industry. But enough about me, let's get on to the presentation. All right, so our agenda overview for today. We're gonna be going through a number of factors here. We're gonna be going through the principles of mold remediation. Uh, we're gonna get into some structural remediation, that is the engineering controls the remediation work procedures, uh, post-remediation evaluation, which is an absolute favorite of mine. Then we're gonna shift over into the contents remediation sector. We're gonna talk about restorability of items, uh, cleaning procedures, post-remediation evaluation again, and then we're also going to close out on a brief snippet discussing HVAC remediation. All right, so principles of mold remediation. So we've got five topics here that pertain to these principles, or five principles, if you will. That is providing for the safety and health of workers and occupants. Of course, our employees are everything to us. We have to keep them safe. And again, without customers, we'd have nothing. So the occupants within these establishments, be it a business, be it a residential home, we have to care for these folks. Uh, documenting the conditions and the work processes. Contamination control, that's huge. We don't want this stuff going everywhere. Contamination removal, and then ultimately contamination prevention. So let's dive a little bit deeper into these topics. All right, so getting into the safety and health of workers and occupants, remediation works, this should say workers, shall be protected from exposure. That is providing proper PPE and establishing and implementing the engineering controls that are needed to make sure that we do have adequate control of our environment. We want to inform the occupants of the environmental conditions. The last thing we want to do is leave Mr. and Mrs. Jones in the dark and have them not realize what they're walking into if and when they go through that zipper. So we also want to identify the safety and health issues prior to work commencement. I think that's a given, but again, what we don't want to do is we don't want to start a mold remediation process and then find out a day and a half into it when your worker, Timothy, uncovers something that really should have been discussed and also caught and addressed at the forefront of the remediation procedure because now we're exposing our workers to unsafe work conditions and heaven forbid one of the residents within the home or business steps into that area and is now exposed to that safety risk. So now documenting conditions and the work process. When we get started with any mold remediation process, I shouldn't say any, but 99.9%. .9%, so let's say the vast majority of mold remediation services that my company undertakes we are going to have assessed by, we live in the state of Florida, so the individual needs to be licensed. So we're gonna have the property or the conditions at hand assessed by an independent IEP. That doesn't mean my other company, Discrete Air Quality, no. That means one of the 
medley of companies that we have down here in South Florida that we can refer that work to. What they're going to do as that independent indoor environmental professional is they're going to come in, they're going to assist in determining causation. The goal for them should always be to identify causation or the source that is creating or at least contributing to the issues at hand. That isn't always the case. In some instances, there needs to be material removal first, but that's always the goal. They are going to want to document all of their findings. They're going to perform sampling if needed. We've probably heard the battle of both edges here, right? Or, or both sides within the industry, which is sampling isn't needed. No, sampling is everything. Well, I like to think it's kind of a middle of the road thing, right? If sampling can be useful in proving a case for or against something, I think it's I think it's a good utilization of your time. If you can collect a sample to confirm or deny whether this mystery substance on the surface is or isn't mold or fungi, again, I think it's a good utilization of a sample. Now, the final closing that that independent IEP is going to provide is going to be the written protocol. This is vital. This is what gives directions to folks like myself and potentially many of you other restoration contractors out there watching this video, the guidance that is needed. That isn't to say that we don't know what the heck we're doing, but it's always nice to have a general consensus on what's going on, work with others in the industry to provide that oversight and ultimately the written instruction sheet, if you will. Now, next up, what's gonna fall back into our court as the remediation contractor is going to be, excuse me, the remediation documentation. This is such a vital component as well. Again, we've all heard the saying, especially if you work with insurance companies, if there's not a photo of it, it didn't happen and therefore you don't get paid. That kind of goes to prove the point of how important remediation documentation is. And then ultimately, the post remediation documentation. When the work is done, but again, prior to the commencement of the rebuild process. We definitely want to have some photo documentation. Normally, this is where you would have that independent IEP come back in to perform a clearance or post remediation verification service. So now moving along to contamination control, and as you see, we've got some uh, air filtration devices in the background with uh, one of our wood frame pressure fit containment barriers. So discussing contamination control, we want to mitigate the moisture to prevent the spread. Normally, what happens in this instance when we talk about mitigating moisture, this falls under the water mitigation or drying side of things, right? We may show up as the respondent to provide an estimate for mold remediation service and then ultimately we may find that hey there's materials here that are still wet that understandably haven't been wet for too long so we can perform a level of mitigation or applying heat to surfaces controlling the relative humidity within the environment and what this is ultimately going to do is this is going to prevent the spread of moisture which is ultimately going to prevent the spread of potential mold growth and other microorganisms to develop. So we also want to consider minimizing airflow to control amplification. So in this instance, let's say we're performing a mitigation service to again control the spread of the moisture. If we see what appears to be mold growth or as a lot of us call suspect mold, suspect fungi, the last thing we want to do is put or point an air mover or a fan at that wall or along that substrate because ultimately we may just aerosolize fungi into the air and of course HVAC systems can pick this up and now we've got a wildfire of mold spreading threat. So we want to avoid that. We also want to aim to contain as closely as possible to the source. So if the source is this wall behind me here and I've got mold on this wall, ideally if we've determined through the course of bringing in an independent IEP that we've got mold limited to this room, ideally, I want to have a containment barrier about no further than at the entrance doorway into the room. And alternatively, if we don't have anything airborne within this room, but maybe we've got the growth on the wall, maybe we consider bringing the containment in a little bit closer, splitting the room into two, which then gives us the benefit of utilizing some space in the room to relocate the contents to. So contamination removal, again, such an important part here. 
source removal, as we call it. This is the removal of the impacted materials. We want to make sure, again, you see that I have here, forego attempts to kill, encapsulate, or inhibit mold. Gone are the days of, we've got some mold growth on the wall, Mrs. Jones, we've got two options for you. We can either remove it, which is gonna cost you X, Y, Z, or we can spray it down, clean it, disinfectant, and then put a EPA registered mold encapsulant on the wall. That is just not suitable in today's day and age. And realistically, it should have never been done once upon a time, but we don't talk about the past. The past is the past. So we want to remove source materials. Again, going back to this wall, if I've got growth on the wall, this needs to be cut out. There is no if, ands, or buts about it. The only exception to that is if we're dealing with what's known as a humidity bloom, or if we know 100% with certainty that we only have mold and fungi potentially growing on the front surface of the wall, and it is in relation to humidity. There should still be some more investigative work to confirm or deny whether the presence of mold has actually penetrated through the substrate, but again, that might be the only exception to limit the demolition aspect of it. Now, the remediated areas should always be visibly clean. So when we remediate a surface, it shouldn't be that we have all of those spots there, and but we've removed the mold, but now we've got all the spotting there. No, if you cannot get everything out of that wall to where it is returned to, as they call in the insurance industry, a pre-loss condition. I do a lot of these, I realize that, I'm sorry. Um, but a pre-loss condition, if we cannot get it back to that condition or what we call a condition one, which is the last point here, then we, we need to continue on doing additional uh, remedies to take care of this here. Remediated areas should also be free for malodors. Malodors are those that are just described as that uh, foul, funky, something out of the ordinary odor. It's something that is not typically present within this given space and it's something that we should not have when we are dealing with mold remediation. If you've got walls that are still giving off an odor, consider removing them, even if it was something as mild or moderate as a humidity bloom. Again, condition one is our goal. We need to clean, treat, and remediate back to that condition one. So let's get into contamination prevention here. So, contamination prevention. We need to correct the moisture issues at hand, right? So correct moisture sources. When it comes to preventing and making sure that we don't have further damages within these areas, again, you can never say never because at the end of the day, nobody can guarantee against a pipe burst, a pipe leak, a roof leak, et cetera, et cetera. But what we can guarantee against is making sure that the same issues that once transpired are not happening again. And we do this by correcting moisture sources. If we had a pipe leak, we want to address that pipe. We want to look down the pipe. We want to make sure that there are no other fittings that look like they're going to go in a short, timely fashion as well. We also want and need to dry materials to an acceptable moisture content. So what is an acceptable moisture content? Well, that's going to depend. If you live in Arizona, your dry standard or your drying goals are going to be a lot different than if you live in Michigan and then equally if you live down here in let's say the South Florida or even Louisiana area where we just have a ton more humidity. So what we need to do is we need to take we need to collect background information, right? So if we're remediating a perimeter wall within a bedroom, then what we should do is go to another perimeter wall within another bedroom that is a known unaffected area. We do not want to reference an excuse me, we don't want to reference an interior wall, right? Because interior walls just have a blank cavity with drywall on either side. So we want to make sure if we're comparing a perimeter wall, we're comparing it to another perimeter wall because that those two uh, pieces of gypsum board, plaster board, duroc, anything you name it, are going to have different moisture content in there. So we want to compare apples to apples. Repairing with mold resistant or mold retardant materials. We've all probably seen these other products out here. We know that we have green board. We know that we have blue board. We also know that these things, as my grandfather would say, are kind of for the birds, right? They, they work. They might be an improvement upon drywall, but they're nothing like these other products out here, Dens Glass, 
Dens Armor, and other fiberglass face gypsum products that, again, literally you can submerge in water and these things just will not grow mold. And the only time you really may have mold on them is if you have a dirty surface where mold can physically feed on. So consider, if you are doing the repair work, consider utilizing mold resistant or mold retardant materials. And alternatively, if you aren't doing the repair work and maybe you're working with a company who is, maybe make that recommendation to either the company or even the client that they should look or opt to these mold resistant or mold retardant materials. So now, structural remediation. This is mold remediation as most of us know it. This is the remediation relating to the property structure. What this does not include is the HVAC system and the property contents. Now I know what you guys are thinking out there. Okay, well when I go out and I perform mold remediation as I know it, nine times out of 10, I'm cleaning the AC system and I'm also cleaning the contents. You are, exactly. But we've broken this up into three different parts because there are multiple approaches to all of these parts and for the purpose of having this in a digestible manner, go with me here. So ACM testing should be performed on all homogeneous or homogeneous materials to be disturbed. Now, you'll notice on the second line, we've got lead testing. We want to make sure that we're performing lead testing on any painted surfaces that may be disturbed during the mold remediation process. Now, here we have pre-1978, and this is something that was established by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, but notice you do not see a time frame for ACM testing. And anybody that you will speak with that performs ACM testing uh, which is asbestos containing materials, for those of you that don't know out there. There is no time frame on it. Yes, asbestos containing materials were used more heavily in the past. No, it does not mean that they are not used in products nowadays. Now, I am not an asbestos expert. I don't claim to be. I know what I know, and for more information on asbestos containing materials, I encourage you to reach out to any one of a number of folks that are uh, appropriately qualified to be uh, collecting asbestos materials and I'm sure they can enlighten you and talk circles around you and make sure that you're up to par and make sure that you know what you're doing when it comes to these laws. Now the potential for dealing with materials that may absorb moisture, that's something you're going to run into when you're dealing with structural remediation. Now that pertains to drywall. We know drywall is like a sponge. Insulation, that is, that is identical to a sponge if you're dealing with fiberglass. So when you're dealing with these materials that are subject to absorbing moisture, we need to be mindful of these because this is not something that you will typically, unless you catch it immediately, just dry out, wipe off, and send on the merry way. Of course, we offer water mitigation services that when we catch these things in a timely fashion, we can restore them to a pre-loss condition without demolition, but that isn't always the case, and very rapidly after a water loss happens, you start to have the formation of microorganisms. So multiple layers of material removal. This is something that you could deal with when it comes to either the walls. If you're dealing with double 5 8 drywall, it could be a firewall within a uh, multi-unit dwelling. Uh, you could be dealing with multiple layers of floors and then here's where it becomes most important because you may have laminate floor on top of uh, uh, carpeting, even though you usually wouldn't, on top of uh, linoleum flooring, on top of VCT tiles, and I'm sure I don't have to tell you here, there's multiple layers to be concerned with when it comes to being cognizant of what may contain asbestos within it. So be aware and be cautious. Now the potential for structural damage may require a structural contractor. Now that's, this isn't always the case, but a lot of instances, especially when we're dealing with wood frame homes and we've got YO lath stucker on the exterior of the home, a lot of times we'll find that the actual wall itself is so degraded on the interior that we just unfortunately have to go and attack the outside of a property. Now this is something normally where I at least would get involved in general contractor because they're going to need to build the scaffolding, they're going to have different liability policies, so on and so forth. So just make sure if you are performing mold remediation services, you are mindful that there are instances where you may need some level of a structural engineer. Now speaking of engineer, let's get into some of these engineering controls, right? We have got 
the isolation of mold impacted materials. Now isolation is not to be confused with containment. What isolation is, is isolation is the, uh, let's call it the closing off or segregating of visible mold impacted or suspect mold impacted materials. So if we've got mold growth, let's say growing on a wall where we pulled the refrigerator out from, maybe we take some plastic visqueen tape it around that area just to make sure that this cannot become aerosolized and you know float around the property. Uh, containment, different, again, different from isolation. Containment is going to be what we previously talked about a couple of slides ago, where if we've got mold on this wall, we might want to build a containment, you know, a couple of feet off this wall, splitting this room into two. We might need to build what we call a local containment, where maybe we erect the containment barrier at the doorway into this room. Then also we've got full scale remediation where maybe we've got a widespread mold issue. We might have some local containments. We might even have source, which what source is, is think of source as literally having the closest quarters containment that you can have. In some instances, our source containment has actually been a six mil clear bag that we've actually taped to a wall cut two little slits in, put our arms in, had you know the buddy system actually tape it up and then reach inside of that wall with a razor in there. It's just like you know your old sandblasting structure in wood class. And we would reach in there and we would cut out the affected material and then you can kind of roll it all up within a bag. So that would be a source containment. But as far as full scale, full scale might be source combined with local combined with full scale where we're going to have uh, containment barriers leading into the home, but then we're also going to have secondary or primary containment barriers leading into the condition three area, which is where we have physical growth. So then we also have decon chambers, which are going to be our decontamination chambers, right? These are going to be the areas that you would place your Tyvek suit on and you would take your Tyvek suit off simple concept, right? But we want to do this within an area that is not within your contained workspace because obviously you pull it all off and you've got growth all over you now and settled spores. We also don't want to do it in Mrs. Jones' living room right outside the containment because I don't need to tell you what she's going to think when she sees you taking off a suit. So this is where we want to have some sort of secondary containment barrier. Um, in some instances where you have a containment that leads directly to the exterior of the home, you do have some advantages. But again, if you're working dead center in the middle of a home, you need to be mindful of where you can set these up. So then within these containments, we measure the success of them by, or one avenue of measuring the success is by pressure differentials. So typically within a containment barrier, we're going to have negative air pressure. This is where we take our existing AFD, which is known as an air filtration device. We may duct this out of a window or even duct this into another part of a home to create a centrifugal effect, if you will. And then what's going to happen is we can monitor the success or the quantitative values uh, commonly uh, measured in Pascal's using a manometer or a micro manometer. So in my case, of course, I don't have one around me here, but I use a fluke micro manometer, and that allows me to read our pressure differentials in Pascal so we can make sure that we're achieving negative air pressure. Now, this is especially helpful when you're working on a mold remediation project, for example, and your team is taking out a ceiling. The second that you have that ceiling removed and now you've exposed this attic access, now you just complete you just threw a grenade in it and all of your pressure differentials are going to be all over the place so pre-demolition and then post-demolition even mid-demolition if, if you can is going to be the best time to take continued manometer readings now there are standalone devices cellular devices that you can actually plug up that can actually work 24 7 if you will and they'll just be running data logging and then they can provide real-time info to maybe a supervisor or manager that's located nearby now airflow and exchange rates again another vital component of working within containment barriers we always want to operate from clean to contaminated so if we look at the example again of this office this is our contaminated wall let's say we've got widespread mold as far as condition two our assessor colleague came in, they tested the air quality, they determined that we have settled spores, they used flashlights, they can see that you know we have a little more dust than we normally have within this property. 
what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to um, implement air filtration devices probably throughout the property. There's probably going to be some level of cleaning going on, but we want to make sure that these air filtration devices are working methodically to kind of drive. So number one, we want to filter that air, but we also want to drive that dirty, contaminated air back toward the source. Again, working from clean to contaminated. And the same thing goes when you're working within a containment space. Ideally, we don't, if we're, if we're bringing in air at this end and our machines at this end, we don't want to perform the demolition service from where the machine is down this way because then our clean area is just going to get re-impacted by all that dust. So again, you want to work methodically toward your machinery. You want to work more methodically toward the most contaminated areas. Air filtration devices, I think we just spoke briefly on those. We have enough information. Uh, think of these as glorified fans that are equipped with HEPA air filters. So they're achieving 99.97% filter efficiency. Uh, HEPA vacuums, again, utilize, utilizing that same type of HEPA filter. We can use these for both cleaning and maintaining areas to also nowadays, you'll notice there's more and more power tools that have vacuum attachments. And this is obviously because of the concerns with mold and ACM and things like that, but more, more and more, the talk of the town lately is silica dust. And we wanna control the silica dust and silica dust exposure. So when we're cutting out drywall and we're cutting concrete and we're removing tile flooring and chipping up thin set and things like this, we are creating an astronomical amount of dust. So we wanna use these HEPA suppression devices to collect that dust and make sure we're filtering it out and exhausting only clean air. Misting, another approach that can be beneficial in dust suppression. Uh, dealing with a wall, you wanna spray it down. We know that we've seen it in the asbestos industry time and time again. They spray down areas. They make sure that they're controlling what's going to be aerosolized. The same sort of principles can be adapted and maybe slightly modified, but then brought into our industry where we're going to mist a wall to keep some of that, uh, the microorganisms that are on that wall, as well as the growth, as well as the dust, as well as just any light flaky substance, if you will, from actually coming loose and becoming airborne. Ultimately, it's gonna make for a much more enjoyable work environment as well. And then closing out here, dehumidification. Dehumidification is vital because number one, it's going to make sure that we're drying down our materials to meet our drying goals. Number two, it's going to create a more comfortable environment for the remediation worker. So we want to be mindful of that. On one note, it can produce, excuse me, on one note, it can produce a lot of heat. So we want to be mindful of that heat load. But on another load, or excuse me, but on another note, it's going to overall probably hone in on a little better of that comfort index. So you just kind of want to find that sweet spot and ultimately encourage your uh, guys and gals to control the uh, dehumidifiers, the air filtration devices, and so on and so forth as they see fit once they're underway. So getting into the remediation work procedures. So we need to make sure when we're starting a project that we are reviewing the IEP's report because after all, why did we bring in an IEP if we're not planning on looking at and reviewing and educating ourselves with all of the information that this individual put so nicely into this report for us. So we need to review this, number one. Number two, and so important, and I do not know why more folks do not ask questions and create conversation. You want to discuss any concerns prior to the project commencement. Don't get started if you don't agree with the protocol that was put in place. I'm not saying you go to bat and tell the IEP that they did everything completely and utterly wrong, but if you feel that a wall that they called for a two-foot removal really should come out to four feet, have that conversation at the beginning. Now, that's a lot different than starting with the remediation process and finding that your mold growth actually goes up higher to a four-foot area, right? That's some of what we call the unforeseen conditions. but you better bet your bottom if you don't if you're not in full agreement with what's going on within the protocol there needs to be a conversation because again putting yourself in the customer's shoes the client's shoes mrs jones the last thing she's going to want to hear at the end when you fail to pass this 
post remediation verification is that, oh, that guy was an idiot anyway and all the things he had is over. She does not care. At the end of the day, especially if you were the one that recommended a protocol be performed, again, voice concerns, have conversations. We're all adults here. We want to work as a team, assessor, remediator, client, and if there's an insurance carrier or property manager involved, we always want to create transparency and have all these folks on the same page. Now, along with that is performing a job hazard assessment. Again, pre-remediation process. We need to walk the job sites. A lot of times this is something that's done with the field estimator or project manager when they go out to actually look at a property. They may walk through and say, this doesn't look safe, this doesn't look safe, we need to fix this, we're gonna need to put that in there. These are things that ideally you wanna catch early on, but at the very least you wanna catch before you put potentially a less skilled individual or worker in place where again, they're subject to being injured, that's the last thing we want. Containing the work areas, we've talked enough about this. We wanna have containment around our affected areas. That doesn't, uh, plastic sheeting, uh, a painter's plastic that does not qualify as containment. If I walk in and see another job where, oh, the company contained the area and all they did was tape plastic sheeting, painter's plastic specifically, 0.7 mil thickness up to a wall, didn't even run it all the way up to the ceiling. Yeah, don't just, just don't do that. Just again, IICRC, you'll notice here at the bottom of every page, every page that I pulled information out of our standard, I am going to reference this at the bottom. That way, again, you understand that maybe these are my words, but more importantly, these are my words that I've modified based on information that I've taken from the ANSI certified IICRC S520. Now, currently, 2015 is our latest edition. I know we're due for one here very soon, but again, this should be your Bible as the remediation professional. So make sure you screenshot this, write this information down. If you don't currently own a copy, you can purchase a copy, you can purchase a uh, physical paperback, you can purchase an online PDF copy, you can even purchase what I have, which is the online access, where I can access it from every device. You pay an annual fee and it's super convenient. But anyway, let's get back to this. So we want to protect against unwanted damage. In its most layman sense, if you're going to be removing a wall, and there is some nice flooring that isn't going to be removed, probably want to protect that flooring. You can use everything from corrugated cardboard to compressed cardboard, such as ram board. Uh, we have masonite. You could even use plywood. There are a number of products out there. Wood, uh, excuse me, flooring is just an example of some materials that we may want to protect. Uh, ceramic tubs, toilets, fixtures, you name it. You guys know what I'm talking about. If there is anything that is deemed as unaffected, we want to make sure that we per we prevent these from A, contamination, but B, unwanted damages. And then ultimately, contamination removal. That would be kind of the next step here. After you've ascertained everything, after you've discussed everything, after you've contained your work areas, after you've laid down your protective materials, now is where we get into the contamination removal. So depending on what PPE our workers had going into this, our workers are now gonna to wanna to make sure that they've got their Tyvek suits on, that they've got their nitrile gloves, that they've got their protective work glove, uh, some level of booties or shoe protection unless you've got it built into the suit. We obviously wanna have some sort of hood. Um, if you've got a beard like me, a papper or a powered air purifying respirator is gonna be your best friend. Um, something that will protect your respiratory system, eye protection, so on and so forth that is going to be vital before we expose our guys to any of this contamination removal because Lord knows what's in there, right? We might be in there for a mold remediation project but not understand that this has been wet for 10, 15 years and now we're also dealing with gram negative bacteria. That's not fun stuff to mess around with and your guys aren't gonna wanna hear after the fact that you just didn't know, it's just not a good excuse. Once the contamination is removed, we get into the disposal of these contaminated materials. Now, fortunately for us, we're not dealing with, in most instances, we're not dealing with hazardous materials. In fact, most mold and fungi impacted materials can be placed in six mil trash bags, tied up, knotted, um, carried from a truck to the city landfill, or placed in any one of these uh, dumpster bags, like bull bag and um, 
whatever the green company is. But we've got all sorts of way to dispose of these materials. What we just want to make sure that we're doing, especially if guys are transporting this in their vehicles, that this contaminated materials is sealed up tightly. And again, we're not exposing our teammates inside of these work vehicles to and from the project. Now, abrasive cleaning of interstitial spaces. So once we've got the materials removed, we've got the, the materials bagged and out of there, now we're gonna get into some of the abrasive cleaning, right? So we've got this wall behind me, wall was removed, uh, dealing with metal studs, right? I've got some rust on the studs. That's pretty easy. You can just take a, uh, you know, whether it's a wire wheel to or a wire brush, we can very easily clean that. If you've got some wood studs, possibly you need to uh, take out the sander, do some sanding. They also have a lot of other materials that are out there now from, uh, uh, let's see, from media blasting materials such as dry ice, soda blasting, and there's some others out there that are a little more, it's like shells or something like that. If you do your research on media blasting, you'll see there's just, there's a kind of a world of options other than just the baking soda and uh, dry ice blasting. But you wanna do something like that. You wanna either do some plain Jane sanding. Um, they also have some peroxide materials that'll help physically lift the mold to the surface, which makes for a little bit better cleaning. Um, but from there, once we've got the space pretty well taken care of, we've done our abrasive cleaning just to kind of shimmy everything loose, that's when we get into the HEPA vacuuming process. The HEPA vacuuming process is going to be going over everything with a fine tooth comb. Again, we potentially have somebody coming in after we're done with our work, but not with a microscope, but let's say, you know, walking through with a flashlight, fine tooth comb, white glove test, black glove test, we wanna make sure that these areas are clean and debris free. So HEPA vacuuming is gonna be your first step. Then we wanna get into some level of damp wiping. Um, we've also got the sandwich effect, which is referenced, I wanna say in the uh, S520, as well as there's plenty other sources out there with HEPA vacuuming, wiping, HEPA vacuuming. Um, some folks will just HEPA vacuum, wipe, HEPA vacuum, and then wipe again. So there is no right or wrong way to do it per se, as long as once you're done with this and once we get into the post remediation evaluation, we'll discuss how you can verify that you had a successful completion to these areas. Here we are, post remediation evaluation. It's like I knew it was next. This is my favorite topic. And no, not because I'm now an assessor, but because I love the science side of things, right? I love going in and doing something and going, huh, Wow, it worked, incredible. Science, right? So post remediation evaluations, number one, this should be conducted or performed by the remediator. What this is intended to do is determine the satisfactory completion. In other words, we wanna make sure that the gold products, right? The gold level of service that we promised Mrs. Jones was actually being delivered upon. We don't want to promise her gold and then give her bronze because, oh, well, we missed some areas, human error, blah, 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 blah. So some ways that we can evaluate cleanliness. And within my company, um, that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on down here in South Florida is we pride ourselves on having the highest quality assurance and a quality control process within the industry. And that's at least down here, that's at least to the locale that I can speak to, but everything we do is equal or greater to what most IEPs are gonna do when they come in. So we can confidently kind of ascertain whether or not this is gonna be a pass or fail. That said, one thing that we need to know before I go on from here is, if you perform a post remediation evaluation internally, like we do, and everything passes for lack of a better word with flying colors and then john doe or jane doe comes in the independent iep and fails you this isn't a case where you jump up and stand up and say no 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 i passed according to my results what the benefit of the post remediation evaluation does now is it gives you an even playing field so then you can have a conversation with jane or john and say hey if you don't mind me asking take me through the process of what you did because when i went out and i did dot 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 I didn't find anything, so um, you know what can I do to improve myself? Again, anytime you can make it about somebody else, genuinely, you know, better. But anytime you can make it about somebody else, like they're more willing to talk to you. So, getting back to this, when we're evaluating cleanliness, surfaces specifically, visual is everything most important. I don't have it here, but I normally have like a 1800 lumen flashlight that I'll just go in and at a 45 or excuse me 90 degree angle 
I'll just kind of cast right across the surface. I lied, that's a 180 degree angle. Right across the surface and see what sort of particulate we're dealing with, right? And you may be saying, okay, well, I'm not cleaning the fine dust. Yeah, you're right, but clean is clean. So if you have a clean enough area where we're just seeing a couple of uh, speckles of dust, then that's a damn clean area part of my language. Um, we can also evaluate surfaces using ATP, adenine triphosphate. And what this is, is this is a device that is going to read ATP, which is present in all living things. So realistically, if you've cleaned the environment to a suitable condition one level, then you should be able to take an ATP swab in multiple areas and have relatively low numbers. Now, don't be confused with the numerical value that you have here, right? We are not comparing ourselves to the food industry where we need to be in single digits down to non-existent. But that said, we don't want to have 100, 200, 300 uh, counts or RLUs as they're called in the ATP world. We don't want to have very high numbers. Realistically, double digits and lower, you're, you're in really good shape here. Um, fungi swabs, tape lifts, same sort of concept here. Instead of ATP, these are specific to fungi and mold. So what we're doing is we're using, you know, a swab like we've all seen, a long extended Q-tip or a tape lift, which we're sticking down the surface and then submitting it to our local laboratory. Arguably, if you have a microscope like we have here in the background, which we used to use once upon a time, you can actually take these samples, go through the uh, microscopy process here and actually look at them. And again, we're not looking to count all we're looking to do is make sure that the, it's a relatively clean slide, and if it is, then you're probably in good shape. Now, when it comes to the air, particle counters can be your best friend. Laser particle counters specifically are what we use. We have a very affordable model, three, four hundred bucks, and then we have a very expensive model, three, four thousand dollars. So usually the three to four hundred dollar device is sufficient in telling us, is this environment clean enough, right? And again, on the saying, clean is clean, which my good friend John Lapater has said for years, whether he came up with it or not, it's, it's stayed up in here, clean is clean. So if we've got relatively low particles, then we know the likelihood of those few particles that are in the air, it's a lower likelihood of those being mold or fungal spores. It's not saying that you don't have anything, it's just saying there's a lower likelihood. And that's all it is, it's an odds game, right? We just wanna get it as clean as possible. Sampling pumps, again, uh, Buck makes them wirelessly. Um, you can get your traditional electric pumps that just plug into a wall, have a stand, it's got a built-in rotometer, which adjusts the airflow on it. Um, same thing, you can submit it to your laboratory or throw it under a microscope look for a relatively clean slide, excuse me, clean side, clean slide, geez, try saying that five times fast. Uh, then you've got some of what a lot of you folks probably haven't heard of, which is a tool that I have and I absolutely love. The micometer and then we also have the Insiscope. Now I don't have the Insiscope because I went cheap, it's very, very expensive, I won't get into price points, but it is a phenomenal device and if you can spring for an Insiscope, it is like a micometer on steroids in the sense that you're going to get real-time fungal data to tell you how impacted an environment is from bioaerosols. Now, the advantage that micometer is going to have, alternatively on Instascope, is that you can do both air and surface samples. So even though micometer, oh, well, you guys are probably wondering what the heck is micometer. So let's get into this. So micometer is a kit. It comes in a briefcase. Uh, think of it like your modern day adult biology or, or chemistry set, right? You can go into an environment and you can take surface samples just like you would, just like you were going to submit them to a laboratory. And then what you can do is you can utilize uh, the chemistry set, as we'll call it, the micometer set to physically read the fungal load and it's gonna provide you it in a quantitative value. So just similar to ATP, you're gonna have a device, a aluminometer, aluminometer, that will actually tell you within about an hour's time a quantitative value on how polluted this sample is when it comes to fungal matter. Now the benefit that it has over reading traditional spores and things like that is if I'm a, if I'm a human spore and my arm breaks off and my hand breaks off, a lot of these areas that don't necessarily show up as a full spore 
on a slide, but it could come up as you know hyphal fragments, which are recorded at laboratories. The benefit here, especially if you're doing an evaluation where you don't really care what type of mold you're dealing with, the benefit is it'll tell you a quantitative value on how polluted the environment is, which is all you really want to know. How much fungi do I still have floating around? Are they high numbers? Are they low numbers? Mycometer allows you to do that again within about an hour's time, mixing different substrates together, ultimately developing these samples. So it does take a little bit of work. Um, it has a moderate price point, nothing like the Instascope, but in a perfect world, if you were have a mold remediation company and you have a budget to blow before tax season, you might want to look into getting a micrometer or an Instascope or both for that matter because it just expedites the process between mold remediation completion and bringing in the independent IEP. But now that we're done talking about all the things that excite me, um, evaluating the moisture content, that's going to be kind of the last uh, the last straw here when it comes to the post remediation evaluation, right? We want to make sure that again, if our guys came in to remediate a wall that was impacted with moisture, if they took the wall out, but the inner structure of the wall, the interstitial space is still soaking wet, that, that doesn't benefit anyone. Like, yeah, we've removed the molding materials, but it's going to come right back. So we just want to make sure we're evaluating moisture. Um, thermal imaging cameras are a great quick snapshot just to show temperature differentials. Uh, anything that looks like an anomaly, you normally want to stick a me meter on. Normally speaking, on a PRE or post remediation evaluation, you just go straight for the moisture meter, whether it's the non-invasive or the invasive kind. Get in there, make sure everything looks kosher, and just kind of move on and call out that independent IEP. Now, contents remediation, yet another fun topic. When it comes to contents remediation, we need to determine the restorability of items. So here's what that means. We show up in Mrs. Jones' home. She's got beautiful furniture throughout the house. Leather couch, um, uh, upholstered dining room set, uh, wooden tables, etc., etc. Mold growth on everything. We've got condition three. It's been a humidity bloom throughout this whole place, right? What's the first thing we do? Do we jump in and we just clean everything? No. Obviously, we want to get an independent IEP to come in and give us a protocol so we can blame them. Just kidding. So we can work with them. But as the restorer, because the independent IEP cannot uh, and, and will not typically stand by your side while you are performing the mold remediation process. So it's up to you as the restorer or the remediator to work in conjunction with your team as well as are in active communication with all material interested parties. Number one, determining restorability of these items. We've got porous, we've got semi-porous, and we've got non-porous materials. Now, wood is going to be one of those areas where, you know, there is some, uh, it, it is porous to some extent, but for the most part, it can be clean. When you're dealing with bare wood and things like that, a little more difficult. When you're dealing with wood that has a varnish or a reflective sheen on it, a lot easier to clean. So we want to first go through and look at these and determine. You may find out right away that some of these items physically cannot be restored. Relocating these contents to non-affected but controlled areas, that's the most important part. We want to have maybe containment within containment, right? So we've got our affected area and then we go out and we build another containment outside of that area where let's call it like our, our, uh, you know, our assessment chamber, if you will. We're gonna put our contents into here where we can control this area, it's away from the growth on the walls, and it'll allow us to then go through and assess the condition of this furniture. We want to segregate these items with like items. Upholstered chairs with other upholstered furniture. Leather goods with leather goods. Wood with wood. You don't always have this luxury, but when you do, it is a thing of beauty, and it just makes life so much easier at the end when there's the post-remediation verification, because again, some items will pass that criteria, some items will fail that criteria, and it's the best thing in the world when you don't have these items mixed together and have to go back through and re-clean everything. Speaking of cleaning, when it comes to cleaning the items, we've got the air-based methods, such as HEPA vacuuming, we've also got air washing, which is utilizing uh, uh, compressed air, either in the form of a compact battery-operated leaf blower, um, uh, air compressors, even the cans that you would use to clean out the back of a computer, some of those can be beneficial. And we've also got our liquid-based methods. 
Uh, for example here, high pressure washing. So we might do need to <clears throat> Uh, pressure clean some materials, but usually let's say we're talking about carpet, right? We might need to use our carpet cleaning device, which is going to have a heated pressurized chamber, which is then going to introduce moisture into the environment. So we need to be mindful of areas that are having moisture introduced, especially if it's an area that was impacted by moisture to begin with and a lot of it. So we just need to be mindful and be able to distinguish, okay, should we go dry or wet cleaning when and why? Abrasive methods, again, getting back to this media blasting thing, this can be your best friend. Um, we never perform abrasive cleaning methods like this, like media blasting on furniture. I just, I think the risk is too high there. Um, I just, you know, if we can't clean it, I recommend a, f a physical specialist, like a content cleaning company that has, you know, the adequate chambers to do all of these things. But um, <clears throat> for me, it's like, you know, it's either it can be cleaned in-house or, it goes out or it just needs to be discarded and that's kind of the way we look at it and then ultimately getting into talking about discarding we've got the unrestorable content so some contents you'll see right away when you've got a wicker style piece of furniture unless it is a family heirloom i strongly advise anything wicker based just be discarded it's not worth it it just it it just needs to go it's so hard to get into those nooks and crannies Again, closing this out, post remediation evaluation, that's going to be, again, where we evaluate the condition of the furniture. But let's get into restorability and we'll try to, you know, get through this chapter in a timely fashion. So we've got evaluating the contents condition. As you see here, we've got wicker style furniture in the background here. This is something that's going to be very, very difficult to keep. Um, I had a client once, uh, actually recently, this picture's from an assessment where um, that they were just really wanting to keep it at least one half of the family really wanted to keep this furniture so they're going to do what they can to try and clean it but it's just it's really not advisable when the conditions are this bad and the growth is that heavy um getting into evaluating the cost remediate versus replacement in my eyes it's going to be expensive any way you dice it to replace furniture of this caliber but this is what this is the question that i ask you is it worth spending around the same amount of money to tr to tr to attempt to remediate and save the furniture than to replace the furniture and know that unless it you know came out of the box covered in mold again which I really doubt that you run the risk of mold growing again right and what I mean by that is to pay ten thousand dollars for a cleaning that has no guarantees per se on furniture like this or to spend around ten thousand dollars to replace that furniture and then start your life over this to me sounds like the big winner so it's always evaluating costs um, and that goes into the last thing setting the client expectations but um, use your previous experiences before we get into that so if you know that you've tried to clean furniture like this like we have a hundred times over and we've been unsuccessful in so many instances use that past experience as the <clears throat> um, uh, the, the means for communication, right? Uh, I, I've attempted this. I've personally been unable to clean this, but set these client expectations. Attempting to clean and then discarding if unsuccessful, that's all too common. Again, we get in, we clean these items. Um, at face value, you know, a lot of times we can pass tests and everything, but the one thing I will always tell folks is you are still going to have mold and fungi embedded underneath those, uh, those woven flaps and areas. There's just there's no way to get in these areas except for possibly submerging this thing and it's just if you're a contents restoration company out there that completely disagrees with what I'm saying here please shoot me a message because I would love to chat because to my knowledge there's just there's no good way to clean these items contents cleaning uh, relocating and separating contents with like items we already talked about that uh, determining the best method for cleaning same thing we already talked about that um, wet or dry when why want to make sure that we know this going all into this uh, testing the areas for bleed, wear, and unintended damages. Again, like when somebody will clean a carpet or a rug, they'll do a little test area to see if there's any staining or discoloration. You want to kind of do the same thing. Obviously, this vinyl coated wire shelf that I'm wiping here in this picture, we're not worried about any of these three factors happening, but um, you know, carpets, leather, rugs, uh, upholstered furniture, all these things we want to be mindful of the potential secondary damages that could be caused here. Uh, cleaning, confirming cleanliness, 
cleanliness and then cleaning again. Clean, clean, clean. That's the name of the game. And this is where the post remediation evaluation comes into play. And you might even want to put in, let's call it a mid remediation evaluation where you as the owner or you as the manager will actually come in after the initial cleaning of the contents, maybe collect some surface samples, maybe do a visual inspection and just see if it's clean to your quality standard or, or quality control acceptable measurement, if you will. Is that made sense? But ultimately, if not, clean, 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 and just continue to clean. And if you fall short of being able to successfully restore this, this is where we separate the unrestorable items. It just goes into another section. Obviously, we don't want to throw this away, but this is where we want to bring it to Mr. and Mrs. Jones' attention, have them come in, inspect these items, gain approval on discarding them, explain the who, what, where, and why, and move forward. <clears throat> Contents, post-remediation evaluation, again, conducted by the remediator. This, as with the other, is determined, intended to determine the cleanliness of, in this case, the contents. Um, normally, air isn't as much of a critical factor here, but the surfaces are. Same sort of concept. We can use visual, ATP, fungi swabs, and tape lifts. Um, when we do want to evaluate the air, because it can be beneficial, my recommendation, as you see at the bottom, is we're going to use an aggressive or activated sampling type. And what is this? You've probably heard the terminology. So if you're using something like mycometer, using something like Instascope, Instascope's great because you're just going to be able to walk through the environment. You, you've got a wand that you're going to weigh around that's actively bringing in um, X amount of air. And as you're moving around with furniture and creating that wind current, beautiful. If there's something floating around, you'll catch it. You can sniff around legs, cushions, so on and so forth. Needless to say, I live vicariously through my Instascope friends. Now, with a micometer, one of the processes that we do is we will use a small portable battery-operated leaf blower. This, the one that I have is made by Makita. It's, it's not much. And the benefit to that is I can go in and I can actually just basically blast air all around the containment area because as far as I'm concerned, when we sign off on a job and we say we're done, I don't want to worry about, you know, a guy or a girl just came in and tested with very, in a very still environment. I want to know that like we got everything airborne that we were testing in like the worst possible conditions. Cause the way I see it is, you know, I'm going to walk into my room here. I'm going to sit down on this chair and anything that's under this chair is just going to balloon effect out. So we want to make sure that we use some sort of aggressive sampling. If we are concerned with the air quality within these, uh, content specific containment areas. Now, last, but certainly not least, HVAC remediation. This is going to be a brief overview. Why? Because I'm not an HVAC qualified professional. I know what I know because I've been around it and exposed to it. So I'm, I'm going to sit here and share that with you guys today, but ultimately make friends with qualified HVAC professionals. If nothing else, you get, tuned, you get turned on to all their cool tools that you think could be beneficial in, in your everyday you know, uses. And then you just, you just, again, come to the end of tax season, you got money to blow. But anyway, on a, on, a, on a serious note here, evaluation of the HVAC equipment is going to be number one. We want to, and normally when I say we, I'm talking in conjunction with our HVAC contractor. General disclaimer, we do not do any AC work in-house. We outsource the duct cleaning, we outsource the cleaning of the air handlers, uh, replacement of equipment, anything like that. We might, you know, help out and wipe down registers and things like that. But when it comes to anything HVAC system related, we've got licensed, qualified contractors that we bring in under our belt to uh, to execute these services, right? So. Working with our folks, we want to determine the age of the air handlers. We want to determine the condition of the air handlers as well as the ducting. A lot of times you'll have a newer AC system, but just ancient old ducting, and that's just never a good mix. Uh, we also want to find out were there any improper installation or are there any installations that arguably could be improved upon? Because if there are, Again, you don't want to have that conversation after work has already been executed. You want to have that conversation at the forefront. So then Mrs. Jones sees that, oh, hey, you know, they genuinely want to help me. They're not, you know, just trying to have add on services. Right. On one note, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. On another note, if it is broke, let's talk about how to fix it. So determining salvageability of equipment. 
same thing. We want to look at it and determine, hey, are these ducts in a good enough condition to clean and potentially encapsulate if they're in a good enough condition? Or do we just talk about replacement? Replacement is obviously much more expensive, but unfortunately, when it's needed, it's needed. ACR 2021 NADCA standard. So previous to this, there was an older one. I want to say it was the 2013, if I recall, but don't quote me on that. Um, I've been up to par on this one now for, I don't know, past six, eight months. So the other one's just kind of a thing of the past. But you want to familiarize yourself with this. The beautiful thing is it's a free download. And whether you're doing the HVAC work yourself or outsourcing it, you want to be able to hold the qualified individuals accountable. So familiarize yourself with the ACR 2021 NADCA standard. You can download it for free. It's got a ton of good information in there. It talks about, again, what we're getting into next here, uh, the cleaning of the various duct system types, your fiberglass, fibrous materials, your flex ducting, your flexible, and also your metals, your, you know, your metal boxes, your metal duct runs, your uh, circular metal, your rectangular metal, all of the above. Uh, it also talks about cleaning of the air handler components, the coil, the blower wheel, uh, the wiring, something that's just commonly left out, and then ultimately post remediation evaluation. HVAC evaluation and salvageability. A qualified HVAC professional is ideal, like I said. Some folks will do it in house. We outsource that area, and it's just so much better than me telling a client that, hey, I think this needs to come out because of that, because the next question would be, okay, and how long have you been doing HVAC work? To which I would go, I watch a guy's YouTube channel. You like that? Like that plug? Anyway, performing a system diagnostic. Again, better to do this at the beginning than to find out at the end that something wasn't working right. Capacitors are gonna go. That's probably the most common thing that happens when we have our HVAC contractor service unit is something always happens and it seems like a capacitor always goes. But if that capacitor was already blown beforehand, that's something we want to know. That way we don't have to eat that cost as well as be the bearer of bad news on the back end because yeah, it's a lot easier to ask for forgiveness. No, it's not. In some instances it is, but if it's broken, we want to catch it beforehand. Um, inspect for damages. This is duct separations, loose fiberglass, uh, torn insulation. We want to determine if the cleaning uh, would be suitable or if replacement's going to be more ideal in this situation. So now the cleaning of the HVAC system. Again, going back to this ACR 2021 NADCA standard, we want to make sure that this is being followed to a T. And if it cannot be for any reason, for any reason, if it cannot be for any reason, there needs to be just cause and we need to figure out a plan B to figure out how to go about this in a methodical approach. Establishing negative air pressure when cleaning ducts is number one. You know, you've got a lot of folks out there that'll utilize, uh, devices like the Rotobrush. And I'm not anti-Rotobrush here, but all I know is the vacuum suction on a Rotobrush, in my professional opinion, is not going to give you the lift that you need, as well as the, I don't know if the term is static pressure because I'm not an HVAC professional, but it's just not gonna give you all of those conditions that you need within a duct system to make sure that we don't have resettling of dust and debris that gets stirred up during the cleaning process, right? So I personally am a big fan of making sure that like the NADCA ACR discusses having adequate negative air pressure throughout the duct system. We wanna determine the best methods for cleaning. That is talking about metal ducting, uh, we wanna talk about fibrous, and then we wanna talk about flex ducting, right? Those are the three main ones. And you know, obviously you don't wanna put a spinning brush like you would in metal inside of fiberglass duct work, cause then you know, you'll have this picture doesn't really do a good job at demonstrating it, but all this beautiful yellow insulation would then just be a big frayed mess. Um, some areas that are often overlooked, the air handler wiring, that is up around the air handler, or excuse me, the fan, the blower assembly. A lot of those wires, because of all the condensation that goes on in there, have mold developing on them, and that often gets overlooked and not cleaned, or they just wipe just the quick surface of it, and that's it the bottom of the coil condensation pan. This is a hot topic, a hot area that somebody takes a coil out, they set it on there, they clean all sides, and then they slide it back in, omitting to clean the bottom. So quick, so easy, a lot of times it just wipes off with a rag. And then the duct junction boxes. A lot of times you'll have 
you know, the one thing that drives me crazy is you'll have a company go through and encapsulate plenums after cleaning them and so on and so forth, but nobody ever climbed up in the attic and cut into the junction boxes, which are also fiberglass, so arguably there's not as cold of, an, uh, of air downstream, but at the end of the day, I think you guys would agree it probably, it probably should have at least a, a thorough looking at. And then ultimately HVAC, post remediation evaluation. This can be conducted by the remediator or by the HVAC professional. This, like the others, is intended to determine the cleanliness of the HVAC system. What we are evaluating here is going to be the surfaces primarily because we're not concerned with the air quite yet. Um, and I'll tell you why. So we want to visually inspect surfaces. We want to potentially use ATP, again, looking for any, any sort of uh, organic matter or ATP substance on surfaces. And we've also got our fungi swabs, and we've got our tape lifts. Now, the reason I say that we're not as concerned with air is because traditionally and customarily, you'll have the mold remediation process take place. Um, you'll you'll confirm that that area is clean and clear and under control. It sounds like a sounds like a commercial. Maybe it's Maybelline. I don't know. One of those. But then you've got the HVAC system that gets cleaned, and then we have the evaluation that takes place. And then ultimately, what I always recommend, again, if folks have the budget for it, run through all of this, do everything that I just said, but then once the AC system's clean, powered back on, and there's some level of normalcy, have somebody come back out and just evaluate the air quality, whether it's uh, pulling uh, spore trap samples, whether it is taking particle counts, whether it's using something like Instascope or Mycometer, just to look at just total fungal load within the environment. There should definitely be some level of a follow-up there. And last but not least, me in a papper, standing under a duck. And I promise, no, those are not live wires. And no, I'm not the one that pulled out that air handler, but that is a property that I was on and yes, posed for the camera. So I wanted to thank you guys for watching. Uh, this is my first little uh, webinar that I've done with AEML. I love the folks there. If you're not currently using AEML, you should. Little plug there. They're great. Ron and the staff, but everyone there is fantastic. Um, any questions that you guys have, I know I kind of breeze through the topics here, but I only have an hour to talk, and if you watch any of my other YouTube videos, I can talk for a lot longer than that. So any questions, email them to josh at learniaq.com. Uh, you can also see me on my YouTube channel, IAQ Josh. And uh, other than that, thanks for watching. Appreciate it.